Subject Advisor for Art, Design and Media at Pearson, and welcome to our Art and Design Network focus on diversifying the art and design curriculum. The agenda for this session is to discuss an overview of how we can make art and design more inclusive, more diverse, looking at example projects that teachers could adapt for their own planning and delivery, and then we'll have a question and answer session at the end. In this online network event, we will discuss a range of ideas and resources for diversifying the art and design curriculum. The session will help teachers support their students explore voices from a variety of backgrounds and artistic traditions, looking at research and resources to inspire creative journeys for the learners. It's important that any work to improve diversity in our teaching and learning is open, honest and non-judgmental. We should acknowledge uh, that this process can be challenging, but we should embrace this challenge in pursuit of a diverse and balanced curriculum. So how can we make art and design inclusive and diverse? Sometimes we are faced with uncertainty when it comes to addressing diversity in the curriculum, as we often have to step outside of our own experience and knowledge. Art and design is by its very nature, a broad and diverse subject. It isn't possible to be an expert in every style and every media. So we shouldn't be intimidated by this breadth of study or set ourselves unrealistic expectations. But how should we approach planning a more diverse curriculum? First of all, we must consider our planning carefully and be mindful of any bias, even if it's unintended. We also need to be prepared to challenge ourselves. Diversifying the curriculum is not a linear journey. It requires constant vigilance, introspection, uh, reflection, and, and honesty with ourselves. Diversifying the curriculum is more than just looking at artists from different cultures or backgrounds in isolation. It's ensuring all backgrounds and cultures are integrated into our discussion of all artistic styles. We can achieve this by making sure that as many perspectives are represented in each project we undertake. If we silo specific artists within certain media or styles, we are in danger of othering and inadvertently creating separation or hierarchy within our design practice. For this reason, it's important that each student can see themselves represented in each style or discipline, regardless of background or experience. In taking this approach, we are working towards a more inclusive curriculum, challenging a historic canon of artists, which is not always representative. We recognize that measuring diversity in a scheme of work is difficult and a sensitive task. As practitioners, we have to undertake this task to ensure a range of perspectives are included in any given project. When presenting these projects to students, we only need to refer to artists without labels to clearly communicate the validity and equity of all perspectives because they are all are just that, artists. So what I would like everybody to do is just take a moment Think of a scheme of learning that you have recently written or a project or an activity you completed recently. And to what extent did you consider the following questions? This is a self-reflection task for yourself. You do not need to share your answers. I just want you to take a moment and consider them. Cultural norms, assumptions associated with an activity, uh, the ethnic origin of any artist's reference, gender or orientation of identity of the artists, such as non-binary, LGBTQ+, neurodiversity, physical or learning disability. While you're considering this and thinking about it, this is by no means a tick box activity. Instead, it's important to consider that artists' backgrounds and experiences and the intersectionality of these shape each individual artist, who they are, the work they create, and how they connect with their audience. To help with diversity within your curriculum, we have come up with a example scheme of work that could be used. 
Uh, we have chosen five artists of different backgrounds and heritage to illustrate how we might approach planning a scheme of work or project with diversity and different perspectives in mind. This is an example starting point for a scheme of work that could be focused around the theme of identity. The aim of the project would be to make connections with community and heritage through visual language. Some activities that you could include in a scheme of work like this is investigating artists or contextual references. It doesn't always have to be artists when you're looking at investigations. It could be more conceptual or looking at the context in general. Um, then creating responses to these investigations, starting to interpret those investigations in their own way, in their own style, in ways that are personal to the learner. They could then experiment with media and techniques and processes appropriate to that line of inquiry, drawing on what they have found in their investigations and starting to combine different styles, materials, approaches. They could also record their ideas through a variety of visual and where appropriate written means. And remember that writing when it comes to our qualifications for art and design is always in support of the visual language. They could also then realize their intentions, bringing all of those portfolios together, creating personal, meaningful, and then informed outcomes. Following that organic creative process from this broad-based theme, they start to narrow down their own individual ideas and perspectives on identity. So now we're gonna look at each of those five artists and I'm going to show you some uh, resources, talk through how you could get students to respond in reference to these artists and just ideas for starting points. Now, this is by no means prescriptive. It's an example of how you could approach diversifying your curriculum and gives you tangible starting points that you could use in your own teaching and your own planning. So Hugh Locke is a Guyanese British sculptor and contemporary artist. He was born in Edinburgh, spent his formative years in Guyana before returning to the UK. Locke explores the visual language of power, how different nations fashion their identities through visual symbols of authority, how these representations are altered by the passage of time. These explorations have led Locke to a wide range of subject matters, imagery, media, assembling sources across time and space, and has very deeply layered artworks. So students could look at his collaborative work, The Procession from 2022. And I found this review in The Guardian quite interesting. The procession unpacks some of this problematic history, as well as taking Caribbean carnival, the story of post-colonial trade, empire, and the current environmental disaster in its stride. Past and present collide and intermingle, throwing up echoes and asides. So we're gonna have a quick look at that link that leads to the Tate. So here is an example from the procession. And you can refer students to this website, giving them different ideas of how they could start to understand its intent and interpret that in their own ways. And it has a very interesting exhibition guide as well to read about that as in there. So it's got some really great background understanding of that. And you may recognize this um, artist as well from one of our recent papers. So in terms of what you could do in response to Hugh Locke's work, just bring back up the slide. So Locke's work is very immediate and physically engaging. It's accessible, it raises questions of historical colonial power and balance and how a person can critique their history um, coming from his, his various inspirations of his background. Um, they could start to respond to that, that work, the procession, in various ways. That for research, they could start to decode the ideas and themes within the artwork. 
They could document the various materials and techniques that are used in that piece. And then for responses, they could start to create some small scale responses using textiles or digital physical collages that are inspired by the artwork. This could then lead on to some further research where the students start to investigate concepts of carnival, a protest, a procession. They could draw and connect and explore visual similarities among uh, these events, such as large gatherings, a display of unity, uh, but with differences in tone and purpose. They could also define the characteristics such as carnivals exuding positivity and fun, whereas protests embody unity for change and processions convey a sense of order and religious significance. Um, in response to this exploration, they could then explore elements related to costume and uniform, flags, posters, placards, uh, and traditionals associated with life events. They could also consider these elements, how they contribute to the overall atmosphere and the, me the message of the gathering or the procession. It's really important that with this, you encourage students to express their interpretations creatively and experiment with different materials techniques in their responses. This approach could not, would not only foster artistic exploration, but also start to encourage that critical thinking and research skills. You could also <clears throat> then encourage them to explore those different artistic elements, such as colors, symbols, and composition. So the next artist we're gonna look at is Njudeka Akunili Crosby. She is a Nigerian born painter who moved to America when she was 16 um, and often grapples with the dual ideas of home in her work. Um, Akunili Crosby's paintings explore a hybrid cultural identity that reflects her strong attachment to her Nigerian heritage and her current home in Los Angeles. Working with photography and painting, Akunili Crosby's multi-layered images of domestic scenes are built upon the artist's personal reflections on history, community, and politics. So we'll have a quick look at her work. Now, all of these links will be in the slides, um, which you can access if you go to the more uh, settings or the resources setting down in your toolbar or above wherever it is located and in resources under documents there's a link to these slides so that you're easily able to open up those links and use them for your teaching and planning. So here's an example of her work you can see that layering the collaging representing her different identities that that come through in that work and, and ideas of home and can lead on to some really interesting work for those learners. Her work would lend itself to painting or mixed media work based on observations of everyday life, such as at home or in the studio and classroom, where the students could consider collage again as a way to add further layers of identity and cultural background to their work, such as this artist does in wallpaper of rooms. Her work can be contrasted with artists such as Bonard and Matisse. It's also really um, good to note that she's one of the artists that are featured in the exhibition that opened today in London at the National Portrait Gallery, which was quite timely. Um, and it's called The Time Is Always Now, Artists Reframe the Black Figure Exhibition. Um, I highly recommend visiting the National Portrait Gallery if you're able to. Here's a link to the, the page there. Um, it's, it's something I'm going to visit next time I go into London, definitely. Um, and if you haven't been to the Portrait Gallery that since they've done the refurbishment, they've done a really fantastic job. And it's a, it's a good size museum gallery where you could take learners. They don't feel too overwhelmed like some of the larger museums and, and can get that really up close and, and, and in-person experience with the artwork. So if you're able to, that's a really good recommendation. Or exhibition to go to. All right, just going to go back to my slides. Okay. So the next artist, oops, sorry, 
is Martin Parr. And some of you may be familiar with Parr's work. Martin Parr is a British documentary photographer, a photojournalist, and a photo book collector. He's known for his photographic projects that take an intimate and satirical, as well as anthropological look at the aspects of modern life, such as documenting the social classes of England and more broadly, the wealth of the Western world. So we'll have a quick look at his website. So this is showing a series that he created, which is the Black Country Stories Project. Um, Parr spent four years working on a commission for multi-story photographing the Black Country. It was an area he knew very little of, other than its reputation as a densely populated post-industrial area. Many of the industries that once made the Black Country great had declined, but numerous small factories and manufacturing businesses remain in good health. And a degree of regeneration has also come as a result of the many immigrant communities that have made the Black Country their home. The region is now populated with many different communities and PAR has explored workplaces, temples, churches, shops, clubs, um, tea dances, dog training classes, and, and many others. The images that he captured celebrate the unique mix of communities living in the area as well as existing traditional black country life as well. Let's just scroll through to show you some of those images on the screen. That's a really honest look at the community um, rather than the perception of what the community is. He's capturing the reality within these areas. Now, students could um, approach something similar to this because um, Parr's photographs celebrate that unique mix of cultures and traditions, um, embracing that role of a community photographer, connecting with the locals and sharing prints with subjects. So students may use this starting point to consider documenting their own community or that of one less familiar, exploring those people and places and objects that represent identity or specific cultures in that community as well. And this could be a really reflective um, practice for them to start to look at and hold a mirror to the, the, the places and communities that they live within. It reminds me a lot of a school that I worked at. And I think this, this would have been a great starting point for some of my learners. So another artist who looks at identity within their community is Zanel Nholi, a South African photographer who uses the camera to explore issues of gender identity, representation, and race. Nholi describes themselves as a visual, visual activist. Uh, from the early 2000s, they have documented and celebrated the lives of South Africa's Black, lesbian, gay, trans, queer, and intersex communities. So have a look at website. So this is from the Tate. And just scroll down to some of their portraits that they have photographed, really representing the identities of the people within their community. Oops, apologies, make that fit a bit better. You can see the whole picture. Now, students could start to explore a portraiture across photography, film, painting, mixed media, and the significance of objects and dress in representing the story of the subject, similar to Mholi's work. Um, and their work could then also be compared to a wider range of portraiture from history, 
such as Frida Kahlo or Gainsborough or Hockney starting to bring different styles and, and investigations and inspiration together to start to respond in their own personal way to the artist's work. I could imagine um, this would be a great artist for students that might be interested in creating their own poses, perhaps looking at the tapestry of their own heritage and what re represents personal objects and dress to themselves. Um, perhaps they could also do projects that start to look at people that are within their family or their um, friendship circle and start to represent them in different ways using portraiture and the, the props that come into that portraiture. And it wouldn't just have to be through photography as well. So they could start use photography as a starting point, but then start to evolve that into other media techniques and processes as well, such as painting, maybe start to bring in some of that textiles work and collage. You could start to look at these artists. I could, um, I go back to here, you can see like some of this technique could be then combined with that photographic technique to explore the different themes and styles that come through in their investigations, not necessarily just copying the artist directly, but taking it beyond just pastiche and then starting to bring those different forms and different colors and styles together to create their own unique style within their artwork as well. Go back to the slides. So the Sing Twins um, are another uh, group. Uh, that's They're two contemporary female artists from England. They're twin sisters and they create their highly detailed artworks together. Um, they've exhibited their pieces around the world. And the Sing Twins, Twins are famed for their intricate, brightly colored artwork, which combine traditions from both Eastern and Western art. And if I just bring up their slides. You can see some of their work there, just make it a bit larger. The sisters have faced many challenges along the way to succeed in developing an international reputation for their art and their own Indian heritage played a significant role in influencing their work. Notice they're inspired by the ancient tradition of miniature painting to address political issues. The body of work explores the hidden narratives of empire, colonialism, uh, conflict and slavery through the lens of India's historical textile trade and their relevance to modern day legacies, as well as debates around ethical consumerism, racism, and the politics of trade. Many of the artworks in this series combine traditional hand painting with scanned historical archival material and digitally created elements as well. So this could be a great starting point for students to start to use familiar items to draw and interrogate as forms or as metaphors or symbols. Um, they could explore more traditional media such as drawing and painting, but they could also start to incorporate digital techniques and imagery to combine elements into their own work, creating that layered effect. Their investigations and their responses as well as experimentations could also then be compared with other artists such as Warhol and Ai Weiwei. And there's some more of their work there. Students could start to extract some of the patterning, what those patterns and symbols mean within the artwork, the messages that they convey. Starting to create their own style or interpretation, communicating the, the messages that are important to the, the student, to the learner. Again, that opens up that digital approach, if that is of interest to learners. Um, the, the specification for all of the qualifications, art design qualifications, um, 
are very broad and students can work in any media techniques and processes of their choice. So for students that might like to work more digitally, you could start to bring in different elements and combine them onto a canvas using a software like Photoshop, but then there's also free software out there that students can learn. Um, and on our GCSE and International GCSE Art and Design course materials page, which I'll show you in a little bit, we have free tutorials on how to use some of that software, uh, such as Pixlr or Canva. Um, and there's lots of different free softwares out there that students could use. They could have digital artwork that are combined digitally, but they could also have physical artwork, more analog work that they scan in and then combine with digital elements as well to look at pattern making and the messages that are being conveyed in their artwork. They could even incorporate their own photography and then manipulate that digitally. I've seen that done very successfully. My students used to love doing that. Um, it's all about that process of development and refinement and how they take the investigations and make it personal and meaningful to them. Just go back to my slides. So to help with um, diversifying your art and design curriculum, we have recently published new resources to help you. Um, and that is the artist directory, as well as the diversifying the curriculum guide. Um, and I'll show you those in just a second. The artist directory places all artists side by side, regardless of their background, culture and lived experience and aims to share an initial list of artists from a variety of backgrounds and communities to help students explore a wide range of voices within different artistic traditions. These practitioners that are in this resource can be searched according to specific endorsed titles and areas of study that enable the students and teachers to find the most relevant examples. Um, it's important to note that the directory is not exhaustive, but can be used to stimulate discussion and further research, supporting each student in their personal creative journey. It's, a, it's very much a starting point and it's not prescriptive in any way. It's just to provide an, a resource to help with that inspiration, perhaps finding artists that they wouldn't necessarily have looked at. If I just show you where to find that. So on the qualification page, so each of the qualification pages look like this. You've got A-level, you've got GCSE, and you've got international GCSE. And on each of them at the top is, oops, sorry, wrong page, is the course materials tab. If you go to the course materials tab, that's where all of the resources for the specification live. And under teaching and learning materials is where you can find the artist directory. And that's the same on GCSE and international GCSE. So it's course materials, teaching and learning materials. And same for international GCSE. Now international GCSE, it's listed under support guide. Sorry, guide. There it is, artist directory. Um, and same for GCSE and for A-level. So it's under guide. And there you can see both of these documents and that's where you'll find them. To show you what the artist directory looks like, just make that a bit bigger for you. So it, there's that comprehensive list. You can download it so that you can Add to it if you want to use it with your students, feel free to share it with them. Um, and you can see it's got an exhaustive, quite a long list, it's not exhausted, um, of different artists that they can look at as inspiration. Um, but bearing in mind that they don't always have to start with artists. So that's why we've also included links here to our contextual references guides for each of the qualification. Um, and if you click on that, it will take you to the guide which lists different websites they could start with um, instead of necessarily artists looking for more conceptual starting points or finding their own artists as well. If you are using the contextual references guide, I always recommend looking at all of the titles, not just the one you deliver, because 
they may find um, inspiration where it's unexpected. If you look at the artist directory, so say the student is interested in working in textiles, you would click on the arrow and in the search bar, you just write textiles and you can see it then filters all of the artists that have used textiles within their artwork as far as we were able to, to find when creating this. Now, obviously artists aren't necessarily focused on just one endorsed title or one area of study. So that's why that's a really good function to be able to search for a range of different artists across that media that they might be interested. If you prefer, you could just go by endorsed title. So if you're delivering um, fine art, you could type in fine art. Again, artists might be working in more than one of the endorsed titles of their work. So if you use the search function, it will bring up all of the artists that come under the fine art endorsed title. And then you can look at the artists that way. You could even then further narrow it down. Perhaps you want to look specifically at sculpture within fine art. might help if I could spell. <laughs> and then it will bring up all of the fine art endorsed titles of sculpture. But you wouldn't even need to have the filter on endorsed title to look just by sculpture as well. So that's a really good resource that's out there for you to use. In terms of the other resource that we've published is the Diversifying the Curriculum Guide. Um, and this is designed to support teachers in planning and delivery of the art and design curriculum by providing a range of resources that promote a diverse, inclusive and equitable curriculum. Um, it's intended to provide starting points for research and discussion, making teachers and students aware of a rich range of artists and designers from all backgrounds. So if we have a look at that guide, okay, it looks like this when you open it up. There is the link to the artist directory, as well as a short video showing you how to use the directory if you forget. That's the video there. Well, after the ads, of course. Um, and then if you scroll down further, there are some external resources that are directly linked to diversifying the art and design curriculum um, and helping you to start to have a look at the curriculum that you offer and identify any gaps or areas that could possibly be improved to better represent your learners um, as a whole. And then there are those links in these slides as well to help you. Um, they come from the diversifying the curriculum guide. Um, they can be really helpful for your planning and delivery um, and starting points for the students' own investigations as well. And that Art Today um, is one that I've used quite a bit with my own students. If you have a look, it, it allows you to search by concept rather than by artist, which is really helpful to students that perhaps maybe want to look at a specific concept. So we look at race, and then it gives different starting points and artists that they could look at as well. And it doesn't have to be an artist that they start with. Again, remember art and design. Ooh. Have I lost my sound? Oops, I apologize. So it's really important that when you are diversifying your curriculum, that you are sharing practice with others. Um, as professionals, we share our good practice with others and we seek expertise and support from a variety of sources. So for example, the Running Me Trust is a really good um, organization that's been dealing with a lot of these um, issues across all subject areas. Um, it's also really important to visit galleries and exhibitions um, involving working artists are always a good way to broaden students' own experiences and consider what resources are in your locality because each of our, lo our areas have very different um, 
communities and backgrounds, so making sure that we're utilizing resources within our own community. It's really important that within the curriculum, we understand that the art and design curriculum is really well positioned to address diversity in our wider culture. It's very flexible. Um, it means that we can teach students to understand how different voices have used art and design to express ideas. And we can start to ask those more difficult questions of ourselves by contextualizing our learning activities with diverse references. Um, like I said, the museums and galleries are a good resource um, and they often are at the forefront of promoting diversity, such as the Time is Always Now um, Artists Reframe the Black Figure exhibition at the Natural Portrait Gallery, National Portrait Gallery uh, that I shared earlier, um, which opened today. The art curriculum supports learning across the wider curriculum. Um, it encourages that cultural awareness, that critical understanding, and that acceptance of different voices of, of, from history. So we are well poised to be able to start to broaden those horizons within our school um, as a subject that can, can tackle these issues in a visual and sensitive way. Um, and then at Pearson, we provide resources and training to support your curriculum planning um, as a subject advisor, I'm here to support, um, and we also have lots of different training materials um, across a whole range of teaching and learning in art and design to, to help uh, support people. Before I go then into the question and answer session, I just wanted to take a little bit of time to show you some of those teaching and learning resources that are available to you. So the starting point that I always recommend to people is the subject advisor updates. So it lives on this main qualification page for art, design and media. So if you just Google art, design, media, Pearson, it takes you to this main page. And every month I will put in an uh, update for that month, highlighting new materials and resources that we've published, any important information or training that's coming up. And if you wanna sign up for those updates, you can scroll down and there is a link there to sign up for those subject advisor updates. I've also added in links on this main page to our different playlists where our support videos all live. You've got the bite-sized playlists for each of these qualifications. There's A-level art and design, GCSE art and design and international GCSE art and design. And then there's a art and design training playlist where recordings of our past events, network events like these, um, as well as pre-recorded training events will all be published on there. And a recording from this event will also be added to there in the next couple of weeks um, once it's been shared and uploaded. And those playlists look like this. So you can see here, we've got some network event that I did in January around component two. We've got mindful photography and curriculum planning. So those are all events that we have had live and then there's some pre-recorded training around understanding the moderation process, um, an overview of the A-level and the GCSE, as well as the coursework marking training, uh, pre-recorded trainings, module one and three as well on there. And that will continue to be updated as well. And then the bite-sized playlists look very similar on all of them. It goes through the different assessment objectives. Um, and we'll continue to be adding resources. So for example, for GCSE, we recently added this written annotation and selection of work video to help you with annotation and selection of work. Um, and we are also currently uploading uh, drawing video guides for both GCSE and international GCSE, which will go on the website very soon. They're all recorded. They're just being uh, double checked and quality assured. And it'll show you how drawing can look in textile design, graphic communication and photography. And we'll continue to add more on there. And then for your qualification, if you go to your course materials page, that's where your support will, will live. Um, so we've got the directory and the diversifying the curriculum guide that I've, I've mentioned as well, as well as those contextual references guides. There's, um, there's a drawing guide, a written annotation guide, but those are linked to those videos that are being uploaded as well. So if you want a more visual way of looking at that, 
And then on the international GCSE and GCSE pages under video tutorials, there are those free um, software tutorials that you could use to possibly expl explore some of the artists that we went through in this um, session today. So they can start to combine the elements from those different artists within their, their own artwork. So that's just a little whistle top stop tour of the different um, resources that are available um, for each of the qualifications. Um, past training content is where these packs will be uploaded and that's the same on all of the qualifications. You can see the packs from our previous training are all on there, including the face-to-face -face training for A-level and GCSE. They've been uploaded to the websites. And then the last resource that is really helpful is the exemplar library. And that's for all three of the qualifications have this. You can very easily um, look for past student exemplars, marked exemplars by performance level and by component. And we they've all been recently updated with new exemplars for all three of the qualifications. So if you go to your qualification page at the top, you go across to exemplar library and you'll be able to access those. Um, and that might give you some starting points and ideas of how you could start to diversify your own curriculum, looking at investigations that our uh, students have looked at successfully um, in their own. And this, I highly recommend this art, craft and design portfolio that just got published. Um, the work is absolutely stunning and really interesting to look at, include, and as well as this component to one for fine art. Um, I must say, I really, I really enjoy looking at those ones during the face-to-face -face training. So that's the resources. If I just go back to the slides. Oh, sorry. Um, for further support as well, um, there's these links in the documents that you can download from this um, the resources tab here. You can email the art and design team to discuss any further questions after today if we if you think of one after we've finished today. Um, you can also book a catch up with me um, on a virtual teams 15 minute catch up, um, as well as read the latest subject advisor update that I showed you earlier. I recommend you, you, you sign up for those monthly updates using the slide uh, link on the slide or on the, the web page um, so that they come directly to your email every month. And the art design communities are another place where you can start to share good practice. Um, they're available to discuss ideas with other teachers. And I'm also in there and I get a notification every time something's posted. So if you wanna ask a question in the community, I can answer that too. Um, and in addition, you can sign up for any future training. We've got some live coursework marking training coming up um, and some face-to-face -face events in China, actually, if you're based in China, that's on the Pearson Professional Development Academy. And like I said, any recordings from the virtual events will be added to that um, YouTube playlist, which I showed you. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you so much, everyone, for attending today's session. We hope you found it useful. Have a wonderful day and stay safe. You may now all disconnect this session.